turn, if you would, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Next Sunday, we'll be preaching a message on the blood atonement of Jesus Christ as we consider the cross and what He did for us there. And then the following Sunday, of course, we're going to be uh, preaching on the resurrection of Christ. But this morning, we're going to finish our series on the Christian home. I'd like you to stand together with me, please, as we turn to Ephesians, chapter 5. Let's stand together, Ephesians, chapter 5, and we're going to read in just a moment, beginning in verse number 20 of our text. And we're going to be preaching this morning on the subject of marriage and how to be a gracious spouse. How many of you are husbands? Let me see where you are. Let's see, all right? All right, how many of you are wives? Let me see where you are, all right? We're going to preach to you husbands and wives this morning. If you're not a husband or wife, I give you my money back guarantee. There's stuff in this sermon for you, all right? There's stuff for single moms and single dads and and uh, young people that are still in college, or you're going to learn about uh, what God wants for you should He bring you together with a spouse someday. So take good notes. Some of us that are married now wish we would have taken better notes when we were younger, right? And so there's something for everybody here today. And uh, I'd like you to read with me as we turn to this passage, uh, beginning in verse number 20. And uh, we're going to read down through verse number 29 for our text this morning. And so follow along with me. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the sanctity of the Christian home. We know that Satan attacks marriage. We know that he has created counterfeit marriages. And Father, we pray that you would help us to come back to the Bible and learn your will for marriage today. May we keep the standard where you have established it, for we believe your standard to be higher than any church, to be higher than even the Supreme Court, We believe that your word is the final authority for our faith. Help us to trust in it, obey it, and believe it this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. A good marriage is not something that happens accidentally. It's not something that just comes together over time. But a good marriage is a marriage that must be built by the grace of God. It must be built upon the grace of God. We learned a few weeks ago that all of us are called by God to be full-time ministers of grace. And I want you to see that in the notes with me this morning from Ephesians 4.29. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. By the way, no godly husband should curse. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of, what's the next word say? Edifying. So God says, instead of using language that tears people down, I want you to use language that builds people up. All right? But then notice the next phrase. The next phrase says here that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. So God says in your relationships, I want what you say to be ministering grace, and grace edifies, and grace builds, and grace encourages. So today, we're going to learn how to be a spouse that is gracious, how to be a spouse that is edifying in the home. Now, how many of you have noticed that in the world, there's plenty of foul language, plenty of cursing, plenty of negativity, people that are picketing, people that are rioting? How many of you believe that if you can't get some grace at home, you're not going to get it anywhere? And God wants us to find our homes to be a place of grace. Now, a lot of times in today's society, because of all of the dysfunction, many times people don't really understand or comprehend God's design for the family. 
And um, I had a, a couple of children recently that were asked some questions about marriage. So one of them was asked, how do you decide who to marry? And one little boy named Alan, he was 10 years old, he said, well, you got to find somebody who likes stuff you like. Like if you like sports, then she should like sports and she should like that you like sports and she should keep the chips and the dip coming. <laughs> I'm telling you, that guy just had it on the mark, didn't he? He just, I mean, 10 years old, he's got it down pat, right? And then there was Kristen, she was age 10. She said, now no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> now hopefully she didn't get, get that from her mother, right? Hopefully that's not being passed down from generation to generation. Then the other question was, what is the right age to get married? And Camille said, 23 is the best age because you know that person forever by then. Not sure about that. Uh, and then Freddie, age six, says, no age is a good age to get married. You've got to be a fool to get married. So <laughs> I'll tell you what, these kids coming up, they're, uh, they're a little apprehensive about getting married. Well, I want to speak to you this morning about God's plan for marriage. And I want to tell you that if you follow God's plan, he's going to bless your home. Now, I've been blessed for 36 years to be married to a wonderful, godly woman. And I thank the Lord for a grace-filled family. And not every moment of every day has been filled with grace, but when we're following God's Word and when we're filled with the Spirit, it's good in the chapel house. And I want to share some principles with you on how it can be good in your house too. The first way to have a gracious family life is to begin by serving. You're going to have a gracious family when you begin this relationship, not thinking, what do I get out of it, but what can I put into it? How can I be a better servant toward my spouse? And the Bible speaks of this in verse 21. It says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. God says, I want you to have a spirit that is a spirit of servitude. Now, the Bible says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to be a minister and to give his life a ransom for many. How many of you are thankful that Jesus Christ came and gave his life for you? Amen. He died on the cross for our sin. And if you want to summarize today's message, if every husband would be more like Jesus and every, every, every wife would be more like Jesus, we would have stronger families today because Jesus came to be a servant, to be a minister to see the needs of our life and meet that need. God calls us to be servants in the home. And first of all, He calls us to serve by yielding our own will, by having a yielded spirit. In verse 22, we read this famous verse to the wives, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, men, if that's your favorite verse in the Bible, number one, you're dumb. And number two, find another one. All right, uh, moving right along. Sometimes folks, that's my favorite verse of the Bible. Well, it's not even to men. It's to wives, all right? So ladies, here it is. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband. The word submit speaks of arranging under. It speaks of yielding to another. Now let me tell you about this word because I know as soon as I speak about submitting to a husband, they don't teach that at Antelope Valley College. They don't teach that at the university you attended. Uh, they don't teach that in society today, that a woman is supposed to support her husband. How utterly ridiculous the world says to that concept. But let's just back up a minute, and let me just share with you before we really delve into verse 22, that spiritual hearts do submit. Spiritual hearts, Christ-like hearts, are looking for the opportunity to yield and looking for the opportunity to come into God's order. You say, why do you say that? Well, the Bible says in Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. When a person comes to the realization that they are a sinner, and they say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask you to come into my life and be my Savior. At that very moment, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in their life. They are born again by the Spirit of God. And God calls upon us as those who now have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. He calls upon us to be filled with His Spirit. We're not to be filled with self. In fact, we're to die to self. We're not to be filled with our own agenda, but we're to desire His agenda. We're to be filled with His Spirit. 
And God calls upon us as spirit-filled Christians, as Christians that are full of God, that we would literally have hearts that are willing to submit to His will. It doesn't matter if you're man or woman, husband or wife. Your job and mine is to find God's will, to find God's authority, and get under God's authority. Andrew Murray said, men ought to seek with their whole hearts to be filled with the Spirit of God. Without being filled with the Spirit, it's utterly impossible that an individual Christian or a church can ever live or work as God desires. So a spiritual heart submits. Secondly, a supportive heart submits. Someone that has a heart to support, someone that has a heart to encourage, is looking to yield and to help. Now let me pause and just speak to this issue, ladies, for a moment. And men, please understand this. Submission on the part of a wife does not imply intellectual inferiority. There are several areas, many areas, where my wife is way beyond me intellectually. There's just some areas she has studied. Uh, there, there may be a few books of the Bible, quite frankly, that she has read and studied and written ladies' Bible studies. And we have wonderful fellowship. And sometimes I ask her, well, what do you think about that passage in Ruth? And tell me about Naomi and her response there. And there's just a lot of areas intellectually. I think of mathematics. I, I loved history and English, and I was all, all into literature and so forth. And she loved calculus, and she loved all the upper math. And uh, so when the kids came to ask me questions in high school about calculus, I'd say, you know, uh, you might want to ask your mom that one, you know. And I never really let them know I didn't understand it all, but I knew that their mom had better intellect in that area. Submission does not mean that a woman is spiritually less than her husband. Uh, how many husbands here this morning would be willing to admit there have been some days when your wife had a stronger walk with God than you did? Any husbands want to admit that right now? Every smart husband has his hand up, all right? The rest of you will see you at McDonald's later on this afternoon. <laughs> When the Bible says that a wife is to come under her husband's leadership, it does not mean that she's intellectually inferior or spiritually something less. How many of you know the ground is level at the cross? All of us are sinners saved by the grace of God. It simply means that of her own volition and of her own will and as unto Jesus, she has chosen to follow her husband's leadership. I love what Joyce Rogers, a pastor's wife, wrote about this subject. She said, to prove submission is a wonderful concept. Jesus became the ultimate illustration of its validity. Although he was co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, he was completely submissive to the Father's will. What an amazing statement. How many of you believe and understand that Jesus Christ is co-equal with the Father in all of his attributes of deity. That's what separates Christianity from Islam, from Jehovah Witness, from Mormons and other cults. We do not believe that Jesus Christ is just another one of the gods. We do not believe that he's just some man that became God. We believe that Jesus Christ is eternal God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, equal. And so Jesus Christ, an equal person of the Godhead, nevertheless voluntarily submitted his will to the Father as an example to all of us for the way that we are supposed to live our lives. God has called us to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to love one another with that spirit. Now, sometimes I know husbands take this passage way too seriously. And I heard about a husband that got so into this, Ephesians 5.22, it was creating conflict in the family. It was like he wanted to read this verse all the time at family devotions. And finally, his wife got tired of it, and she shared a little insight about her prayer life. She said, sweetheart, I want you to know, I've been praying that God would help us stop all of this arguing by taking one of us to heaven, and when he answers my prayer, I'm moving in with my sister. I just want you to know that. So I don't advise husbands that you quote this verse every time there's a little marital conflict. In fact, if you have to run around saying, I'm in charge, I'm in charge, I'm in charge, you may not be. I'm just telling you that right now. So what does a wife do when she has a husband, though, who doesn't obey the Bible? He's not even a Christian, maybe. I mean, how does a wife come under that? And how does she operate in that context? Because that's real life, isn't it? Well, look what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. There it is again. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be one 
by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now the word conversation, if you see it there in your notes, the word conversation, by the way, your notes are in the outline if you want to follow, that word conversation means lifestyle. Okay, So it means that if a wife has a husband that is not a believer, that by her very lifestyle, he can come under conviction, and one day he can be won by the word. One day he can see in her life enough to be convicted of the fact that he needs Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, probably about 25 years ago, we started, all of the adult Bible fellowships started uh, getting formed at that time. And, and uh, one of the classes that we decided to start, we call them connection groups now, they meet at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. One of them was called the ladies' class, and my wife taught the ladies' class, and boom, just immediately it seemed like there were several dozen ladies who had their names on the roll of that class, and they were attending, and a lot of these ladies had husbands that weren't coming to church, husbands that weren't saved, husbands that were even critical of their faith. And it was amazing because Terry did not teach them lessons on how to straighten out your husband, you know, uh, how to, how to uh, get your husband to church. She didn't teach them lessons on, you know, what to do to your husband. She taught them lessons on how to be a godly wife and how to be a godly example and how to read the Bible and apply it to your everyday life. And amazingly, you'll never guess what started to happen. There were these husbands that started coming into church and these husbands that started accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior because of these wives who were living out the gospel in front of them, they became attracted to what the wife had. There was one lady named Sean Myvat, and she attended for about 10 years, and finally her husband started coming, kind of sitting in the back, and actually, you could tell he didn't want to be there. I mean, he had a furled brow. You, know, you ever try to preach to a guy like this? <laughs> I mean, the body language is like, all right, go ahead, give it a rip, punk, you know. <laughs> They're just kind of, sort of just not really there in the spirit, you know. And, uh, and her husband, Tony, that's how he was. He was in the back. But then he kind of moved up a little more and a little more. And finally, Tony accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. And I remember going up to Tony. I said, Tony, what was it that finally brought you to Christ? And this is what he said. He said, Pastor, every morning I watch my wife get up, take out her Bible and read it, pray. Every day she had such a wonderful spirit towards me. And he said, finally, after watching her quietly live the Christian life in front of me, I knew that I needed Jesus Christ as my Savior. Why? Because of a wife who did her very best to support someone who didn't always deserve it, but she did it for the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God blessed her with a Christian husband. So we must serve by yieldedness to the Lord, and, and as a wife yields to her husband, God begins to honor that. And then also we must serve by love for Jesus Christ. Let me just touch on this. Notice if you would in verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now there's two quick lessons I want you to see before we leave this verse. Number one, the Bible doesn't teach that a woman in general is in subjection to the male population, all right? That's not what it teaches. It says, unto your own husband, okay? So ladies, the Bible says that in everything, whether it's government, whether it's the church, or whether it's the home, God is a God of order, and in your home, uh, he has given this to you. But not only do we see that you submit to your own husband, the key to this whole passage, verse 22, as unto the Lord. Let's say that together, as unto Simply stated, because the obedient spiritual wife's submission is ultimately to the Lord, her attitude is that she lovingly submits as an act of obedience, not primarily to her husband, but primarily to the Lord. Every wife here would say, there's days when my husband does not deserve my support, but my Lord is always worthy. And so a godly wife, as unto the Lord, supports her husband. How do we have a gracious spouse in the home? How do you become a gracious spouse? First of all, through serving one another. Notice, secondly this morning, through sacrifice. Through sacrifice one towards another. Now notice in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now I want you to notice as we turn the page a little bit to the husbands, God calls the husband to lead by sacrifice. And we see, first of all, this sacrifice involves a selfless love. Ladies, hold on for just a second. Some of you that are going, what in the world? i got to submit. He's just got to love. Just give me another minute. I want you to see the kind of love we're talking about. 
Because the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We're talking about crowns in the forehead and nails in the hands kind of love. And God says, I want husbands to love their wives with a selfless love. I heard about a little girl that was asked, what's the best picture of love that you have seen? And she thought about it. She said, well, she said, my grandmother has arthritis. She can't bend over to put on her her toenail polish on Saturday nights before church. And she said, every Saturday night, my grandfather, who has arthritis too, kneels down and paints her toes with the toenail polish. An unselfish love. Probably my strongest mentor in ministry has been Dr. Don Sisk. Dr. Sisk is now in his mid-80s. He's been married to Virginia for more than 60 years. All of you who've heard him love him. You know him. He loves missions. He loves to see God's people get involved in missions. And he loves to preach. He's called to preach. And there's something about the call to preach. It just never runs out. You just do it until God calls you home. And and he loves to preach. But his wife is now experiencing her first, uh, or rather her third uh, tumor. But this is the first time that the surgeon said, We cannot do surgery on the tumor because of your age. And so now Virginia's in her 80s with an inoperable tumor. And this past week, because of the tumors, she began to experience hallucinations and she was passing out. And for the past several weeks, Dr. Sisk, who loves to preach, has canceled his meetings. He's not traveling. He's not preaching out. He's not seeing his friends. He's staying at home. And he's ministering to his wife's needs, and he's helping her to have food, and he's helping to take care of her while she's in the bed, and he's reminding her when the hallucinations come that that's not reality. And he's loving her like Jesus would love her, with a selfless, sacrificial love. This is something that happens, husbands, when we make the willful choice to do what God has called us to do. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 18, No man taketh my life from me. I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. Listen, the Roman soldiers did not put Jesus on the cross. He voluntarily went to the cross of Calvary because he loves you and because he loves me. It was a selfless kind of a love. I heard about a couple that was having a heated discussion about family finances, and they were being very selfish. The husband finally got on one of these kind of authority kicks, and he said, look, he said, I want you to know if it wasn't for my money, you wouldn't have that television over there. And if it wasn't for my money, you wouldn't be sitting in that chair right now. If it wasn't for my money, it wouldn't even be in this house right here right now. And she thought about it for a moment. She said, are you kidding? If it wasn't for your money, you wouldn't have me in here right now. Now, folks, I hope we're not staying together for the money or for the kids, as noble as that might seem. Kids grow up and leave the home. You better have something more than that in life. God has called us to a selfless love. It requires a willful choice. It requires a devoted commitment. Jesus said, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And the way to find the meaning of life is to learn to love the way that Jesus loves. And so it's a selfless love. God calls husbands to a selfless love, but it gets deeper than that, fellas. So hold on a second and look in your notes. He's called us also to a spiritual leadership. And I have found that a Christian wife responds well to a spiritual leader in the home. And notice what kind of spiritual leadership, verse 26. He, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now let me give you the picture here. The picture of marriage, husband and wife, is pictured in Jesus and the church. Jesus and the church. The church is called the bride of Christ. How many of you as a church recognize that we are to follow and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ? And that Jesus purchased us with his blood. And so this relationship between Jesus and the church is to be mirrored between the husband and the wife. And Jesus provides leadership to the church. And so in this verse he's saying the husband is to provide leadership in the home. And specifically he says that as Jesus washes the church through the water of his word, we are cleansed by the word of God, that the father and the husband is to provide spiritual leadership so that the Bible is so permeating in the home that the home is sanctified from the wickedness of this world. So notice if you would in verse 26 it says that we 
are to be sanctified and cleansed with the washing of the water. The word sanctify means to make holy or consecrated. Now how many of you have noticed that in the world in which we live, there is much that is unholy. And we notice that there are uh, cable TV channels, and we notice that there are old friends, and we notice that there are situations at work that would pull us away from a lifestyle that is reflective of Jesus Christ, our head. That's why the word church, ecclesia, means a called out assembly. How tragic that there are so many churches today that are looking more and more like the world and sounding more and more like a warmed over rock concert and very little Bible is preached. Ladies and gentlemen, the church is a called out assembly and we're to be distinct in this world, you see. But your home is to be distinct in this world. Your marriage is to be distinct in this world. And so think about this matter of a consecrated life that the husband is leading toward. Not only producing a consecrated life, but secondly, producing a cleansed life. Notice in verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That's why a husband should read the Bible in his home. You say, Pastor, I don't know how to do it. I don't know where to do it. Some of you still get nervous just to pray for your lunch. And by the way, take those small steps in leading your home. But you know, it's okay to open your Bible with your wife in the morning and read a verse or two, or three. Why? Because the Word of God cleanses your home. Wherewithal shall a young man uh, cleanse his way? And wherewithal shall a young man find cleansing? By taking heed thereunto, according to the Word of God. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. I think about our children going out to schools tomorrow. Oh, how they need the Word of God to direct them from right and wrong. And God wants our homes to be a place of spiritual direction. Jesus praying to the Father said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In other words, the only way that the church would be set apart in this world is by the word of God. And the goal of the husband is to lead by example in bringing his family around the truth of the word of God. Two ladies that back in the day were at a laundromat and they were sitting there kind of fixing up some pants and sewing up some pants, and they were talking as they did it. And one lady said, my husband is so miserable. He can't find anything good about our house. He can't find anything good on television. When we go to church, he doesn't like the song director. He doesn't like the pastor. He just can't find anything good. He is so unhappy. And the other lady said, well, that's interesting. She said, my husband's so happy. He likes to go to church. We laugh all the way on the way home from church with joy in our heart. And, and uh, he loves the pastor. And he, there's just joy in our home. And, and they were just kind of comparing notes a little bit. And then suddenly it grew quiet as they were there in that laundromat patching their clothes. It got very quiet when they noticed that one lady was patching the seat of the pants and the other lady was patching the knees. One lady had a praying husband. One lady had a godly husband. And she had a happy home. And gentlemen, always remember that your home will be the reflection of your leadership. Your home will be the reflection of what's going on between you and the Lord. And when there's something going on with you and the Lord and there's joy in your heart and joy in your life and you're loving the Bible and you can't get enough preaching and, and you're reading it at home, listen, it's going to be reflected in your family because you as a spiritual leader are setting the tone. So many times fellas say, well, my wife doesn't do this and she doesn't meet this need or that need. And they never like it when I look him in the eye and say, your wife is a reflection of the leadership you're giving in the home. God has called you to lead in that place. Every couple needs to recognize that God has called us to a consecrated life, to a cleansed life. And every husband should care about that. Every husband should have a protective nature for his home that, that the world would not invade, but that this would be a place of grace and a place of peace and, and a place of order. Let me give you just a couple thoughts on, on how to maybe set up some protective barriers in your home. First of all, let me encourage you, set apart time every week to build your relationship. That's what you did when you were dating. That's what you did when you opened the door for and, and you were getting along in those early moments of, of uh, relationship. And, and make sure that even after you're married, you have a date night where you sit down and you tell one another you love one another and you listen to some of the needs that are going on in one another's life. Secondly, let me encourage you with this. As you make these protect protective barriers, make the Word of God your final authority. Every family needs a final authority. And I got news for you. It's not the husband. The husband's under authority too. I'm under the authority of this book right here. And you should also agree that in your home, 
That the word of God will be your final authority. So many men, their company's the final authority. They'll move across the country for 50 cents. You ought to determine to get yourself into the church where the Holy Spirit's working on your heart and where you're growing and get some roots in there and put your spiritual life before your, uh, your life of career and do what God has called you to do first and foremost. But make God's word your final authority. When you make major decisions, get into the Word of God and pray and seek God's face. And then thirdly, agree on some boundaries of holiness. Agree on boundaries of holiness. When I meet with our new members in the core class, I always tell them the same thing. You're going to hear some sermons that challenge the way you live. Some of you have heard a few things this morning that you maybe haven't heard in church. And some, sometimes people say, you know, you get kind of personal in your preaching. I don't know any other way to go. Hey, folks, if this Bible's not affecting the personal way you live, I'm not really preaching. This Bible is a change agent in our lives. It's alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Every time the Bible's preached, something ought to happen deep within your heart that shows us we've got to change and we've got to grow. And I'm saying this morning, we need to grow in our marriage. Make sure you have some boundaries in your life. Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust of the flesh thereof. How about this verse, Psalm 101, 3? I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Let's say that together, man. I will set... That might affect the channels you have on your television. And you sit down and talk about that. And you talk about some of your friends and some of the stuff they do at parties. And as a husband and wife, you ask this question. Is going to that party going to help our marriage? Those are good questions. And you sit down because the world is programming you through television and through the internet. But sometimes we need to say, Lord, put a boundary around our marriage so that we're not taken way away from you in this world. We want to live for you in this world. And so make sure that you have some guidelines of accountability. Lots of couples in our church, husband has one part of the password for the internet, wife has the second part. They've just decided we're going to be together on the internet. We're going to know what's going on there. Make sure that you're working together in this matter of sacrificially living for one another. And so we see that spouses, gracious spouses, serve one another. Gracious spouses sacrifice for one another like Jesus did. And then notice finally this morning, gracious spouses bring security into the marriage, through security into the marriage. You know, one of the great things I love about being a Christian is that I never have to doubt the love of God for me. I mean, it's as simple as John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. He loves me. Husbands, you don't want your wife wondering about that. Wives, you don't want your husband wondering about that. You want to build security into that family. Trust. You want to elevate dependability so that you eliminate doubt. You want to live your life like Jesus so that no one has to wonder about your love for the family. Now let me share a few thoughts on how to build security. First of all, through expressive love. You build security through expressive love. Look at verses 28 and 29. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Now some of you ladies go, that's a whole lot of love right there, pastor. You just really don't understand. It's not talking about the size of your husband, okay? What it's saying is God knows the ego that we men have, and God knows that we want to take care of our headache. I mean, guys have a little headache, but it's really not little. It's a migraine. And guys, you know, when we have pressure, we don't have just a little. We got lots of pressure. And, 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 and God says, I know how you guys like to take care of yourself, so I'm going to put it down on the bottom shelf for you. Take care of your wife like you take care of yourself. I want you to express your love to your wife. And notice what he says here, verse 29. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. So God says the way you nourish and cherish yourself, I want you to treat your wife in that way. So first of all, expressive love. He uses the word nourisheth, which means to provide for one's needs. Nourishment provides security. Nourishment is done with your talk. It is done with your teaching. It's a nourishing along the way of expressing your love to your spouse. So one exhaustive study has shown that no woman has ever shot her husband while he washed the dishes. In other words, talk is cheap. God says, I want you to talk it, but I want you to walk it. I want you to be expressing your love 
to your spouse. This is an expressive love. But secondly, there is an emphatic love. There's an emphatic love because it says we're to nourish, and then it says here we are to cherish. And this speaks of fostering tender care. You might cherish with your touch. You might cherish with your tone. There's a way to cherish. There's a way to alienate. Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 7, but we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth her children. In other words, he loved the flock and, and he cherished them. He wanted them to know that he loved them. And he said, just like a nurse cherisheth her children. And I don't know about you, but when I have to go into the nurse and get some blood drawn, I want the cherishing type. I'm telling you that right now. I had to get some blood drawn the other day, and I like it when they say, okay, Mr. Chapel, this isn't going to hurt. It's just going to be a little, little sting. That's a good thing. I like it when they say, all right, just put your arm out here, and they, they put that rubber band in. I like it when they say, oh, you got a good vein. I'm like, yes, praise the Lord for the good vein. <laughs> Hit the good vein right there. Hit it dead on. I do not like it when they're like digging. Oh, didn't find it. We'll get it here, though, and start digging around. Like, That's not a good thing. And I've had some nurses that I think watched one too many episodes of Godzilla when they were growing up. They don't even try to find the good vein. They just start poking and seeing what they can get. All of us appreciate someone that has this spirit that's more along the nurturing, cherishing side of things. And husbands, too many times. We can come home from work and instead of showing emphatic love, we're still fighting like we were on the commute. We're still barking out orders like we were at work. And God says, I want you to learn how to nurture and how to cherish. I want you to build security in that home. And Terry, I really believe, married me in part because she sensed that other than the Lord, she was number one in my life. No one else mattered more. And I made her to understand that in every way possible with notes and candy and Hallmark cards and everything else you could possibly imagine, precious moments, figurines. We've got chest loads of those things. Why? I was cherishing her. I was letting her know that she was all to me. The fact of the matter is that emotional love wears off, but biblical love doesn't have to wear off. I heard about a lady that went to visit her husband as he had just had a surgery and he was, he was coming out of the anesthesia and he looked up and there was his wife and he said, oh, you're so beautiful. She was so flattered. She stayed there for a little while. A little while longer he looked at her and, and said, he said to her, he said, oh, he said, you're so cute. She said, what happened to beautiful? He said, the anesthesia is wearing off. <laughs> I meet some couples like that. You see, the world's love wears off. Back in 1974, Captain and Tennille, really popular pop singers, and they sang a song, Love Will What? Keep us together. All right, we know some of you were in 1974. <laughs> Love will keep us together. And it did until several years ago when they divorced. The world's love can't keep you together. God's love can keep you together. And God says, I want you to learn how to build a gracious Christian family. Now think of this as we close. Look at this slide here real quickly. I want you to see it. Fellow slide here real quick. There we go. Here we go. A gracious spouse submits to the Lord, sacrifices for loved ones, and provides security through godly behavior. All right? Let's have all the married men say this. Ready? Begin. A gracious spouse submits. Fellas, you sound like the third grade class. Now we're going to have to do better than that here. But lunch is coming, but it could be a while, just depending on how you help me right here, all right? All right, I want the fellas, all the married men. Fellas, if you're not married, pitch in, help some of these guys. Here we go. Some of, some of these married men can hardly speak right now, so some of you single men help them. Here we go. Ready to begin. A gracious spouse. Okay, this is what God calls us to do. He says, I, I want you to submit to the Lord. And a part of that for a lady is submitting to her husband. I want you to learn how to sacrificially love. And then as you do that, you're going to provide security through your nurture and through your cherishing in the home. Now, the wonderful thing about this, as I close, is that everything God tells us to do in the home, He already has done for us through Jesus Christ. So think about it for just a minute. Jesus Christ submitted to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but what does he say? So Jesus is the example of submission. 
Secondly, he says, I not only submitted to the Father, but I sacrificed for you. I went to the cross of Calvary. I shed my blood for you. And not only did I do that, but all who accept me as their Savior are secure, eternally secure in my hand. No one can take you away from me. You can never lose your salvation. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. God tells us then, look to Jesus for your example. He submitted. He sacrificed. He provides security. Now, if you're here this morning and listening to this message, and you are not 100% sure that if you died, you would go to heaven, you do not know in your heart of hearts that Jesus Christ is living within you, then I want you to be encouraged with this thought. You can't build a Christian marriage just with these principles. You've got to have the Lord in your life helping you along the way, giving you the grace. If you're here today and you're not sure that heaven's your home, you don't know that Christ is in your heart, then I want to encourage you this morning to recognize that all of us are sinners who come short of the glory of God and that Jesus died for our sin. He shed his blood so that our sins could be forgiven and he rose up again to prove that he is God and he's seated now at the right hand of God the Father. And for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can call today to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to come into your heart and save you. Now, you can't do it for your wife. You can do it for yourself. And you can't do it for your husband. You can do it for yourself. But every individual here should have a spiritual birthday when you prayed and received Christ as your Savior so that you can say from that day forward, I know that I'm saved and on my way to heaven because Jesus Christ is my Savior. And if you've never prayed that prayer, I call upon you and encourage you today to trust Christ as your Savior. And if you're a saved man or woman, I encourage you to follow these principles for godly relationships, gracious living in your home.